Th this is uh, Robert Stark. I'm uh, joined here with uh, Ryan uh, Andrews. He has written for uh, VDAR, our Radix Journal, and uh, Alternative Right Blogspot. Uh, Ryan, it is uh, great talking to you. Great to be here. You uh, wrote this uh, novel, The Birth of oh, Prudence. I, I'm, I'm also here too. Should you? Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, and I'm also joined here with my uh, co-host, uh, Pilliter. Hi, Ryan. I really enjoyed your uh, novel, The Birth of Prudence. Thank you. Uh, Ryan, can you tell us about yourself and uh, how your uh, kind of political views have evolved and how you became uh, politically aware? Uh, yeah, okay. Um, I don't know. I just, uh, I guess I've kind of always felt something like this. Um, I wasn't very political until, <clears throat> geez, I don't know, late high school, early college. And, uh, you know, started reading a little bit of Amran and stuff like that. This is maybe, you know, early to mid 2000s. Uh, and, uh, just went from there, you know. I like I say, I, there's not that much of an evolution. I wasn't ever a libertarian, you know, like a lot of people. I just became politically aware. This became kind of my issue. Like, you know, I was focused on immigration a little bit. That's why. I, so I was reading V Dare at the time. And uh, did you have like a personal uh, experience that exposed you to the immigration issue? Personal experience. Um. A personal experience? Uh, no, I, I would guess not. So it was more uh, online research or more personal observations? Yeah, it's more uh, more ideological, intellectual, not like yeah, reaction against oh my neighborhood's gone to shit or whatever. You know, it's, it wasn't that. You know, lived in a quiet suburb, so uh, quiet far out suburb, pretty white. Um, so yeah, it's just an intellectual evolution, I suppose. <clears throat> Excuse me, I suppose. Uh, Read, uh, so I started reading Amran, and then, you know, when the alternative right came out, I started reading that, and then uh, that's it. Not a, not a long story, you know. You have this uh, book called The Birth of uh, Prudence, and uh, Pilliter, you read it. I haven't uh, read it yet. Yep. Was that inspired by uh, personal experience? No, no, not at all. Uh, it has almost nothing. Like, there's, not, there's almost zero personal experience. Uh, uh, you know, experiences in the book or personality traits in the book or characters I knew in the book. It's, yeah, it's all pretty much just made up. There's, there's, there's a side character called Troy who has like, he says like two different lines that I've heard from two different people and I use that. And those two people s very slightly influence him, he, but he's a minor character. And yeah, all the major characters... Not really. I mean, Ethan, you know, the one guy in the debate, the two sides of the nationalism versus uh, versus universalism debate. I mean, he thinks like me, but that's as far as it goes. Is it so the, there's kind of this overall there is this girl, Prudence, and uh, mm -hmm. she is Korean and she's very uh, into like a Western civilization. Is this sort of do you play in the dichotomy? Between, yeah. Yeah, do you play on the dichotomy between sort of a civic nationalism versus uh, ethno nationalism? Uh, not especially. No, that's more just there to sort of. That's sort of the tragedy of the book is that is just that she is. I guess you could call her a civic nationalist. I don't really. I wouldn't really frame it that way in her case. It's more. Uh. I guess you'd call her more of a classical liberal. I don't know. She, you know, she's just Eurocentric in her tastes and her her philosophy, that sort of thing. You describe the novel uh, as a tra <laughs> tragedy. Mm -hmm. Do you see a Mark and Prudence as being uh, meant to be together? And if they divide, is that the tragedy, or do you see their relationship as a tragedy? Mm -hmm. Good question. Uh. And I suppose both could be. I mean, in the case of the book, obviously, spoiler alert, it's that they divide. But, yeah, you could you could take it in either direction. I mean, the tragedy is that, you know, he gets his whole... He becomes unattracted to her because of all the things he learns from her. And so, 
you know, I guess I'd leave it at that. I, um, well, let me see how else I could frame this. I mean, it's sort of complicated. She's, uh, the, the tragedy, mm, I'm having a hard time framing this right off the top of my head, but it's that he, he learns it from her and it's not like just that she's sort of appreciates the West. It's that she appreciates a certain kind of art in the West. And that's like why she's attracted to him in the first place. So there's, that's the other layer to it. You know what I mean? She appreciates tragedy actually as a great Western product. And she, so if she's attracted to sort of what she perceives as a passionate person, a person who feels deeply. And she sees that in Mark. And because of Mark's passion and feeling deeply, he wants something greater, and he gets that from her. So they seem to have, you know, it's sort of a perfect symbiotic relationship. But because of what he learns from her, what he wanted from her, and what she liked about him in the first place, that's what drives them apart ultimately. I'm what sure. is there a like a core political uh, or ideological message that you want to get across with this book? Well, not with the story, really. Not with the story of Mark and Prudence. That's simply, you know, you know a tragic love story. But with the <clears throat> with the argument between Ethan and Logan, yeah, uh, it's you know, ethno nationalism versus universalism. Have you ever heard of the concept called yellow feminism? Um, probably heard of it, but I don't. Not familiar with it. The idea tenet. goes like this. If feminism in universal terms means that you're against patriarchy, then, you know, um, that mm -hmm. means you have a dislike, honestly, of men, right? But accordingly, uh, feminism, according to the Asian world, or yellow feminism, it turns out it's against Asian patriarchy. So Asian women will go ahead and fall for uh, white men instead and basically create this uh, healthy, conservative, uh, white Asian, white male, Asian female thing that's happening, and they flee their uh, Asian males for white men. And so yellow feminism benefits uh, white men patriarchal and doesn't, it's, it's a funny thing that well, happens. Is it that they explicitly want to embrace, I don't know, white masculinity, as you put it, or is it just that that's sort of a reaction that they're just reacting against, you know? Yeah, you have to think sure. about whether they're reacting or they actually fall in love with the white masculine side and they just use the words of feminism to really appreciate that. But it's something that's well talked about in feminist cycles and have caused an uproar, especially in Asian American studies. But it's pretty funny and it reminds me of something with this character between Mark and Prudence. Oh, I don't know if father, Prudence is a yellow feminist, but... You mean like in her relationship with her father? Yeah, yeah, the same. That's yeah. what I was thinking. Yeah, I suppose that's there. That's sort of just a more, I was just kind of picturing just as a more traditional, you know, teenage girl rebelling. And at that point, she's not thinking about like racially, you know, and she never is, frankly, in the book, thinking of things racially. Do you personally like have a strong opinion of a white male, Asian female cup? Uh, relationships? Um, no, not really. I mean, my ideal would be an ethno state, so that would not be an issue, really. But no, I mean, I don't care. I mean, my overarching philosophy, or I guess ideology, uh, is, you know, particularism. So, and I've, I've written about that in many other places. I have an article coming out soon, a really long article. <clears throat> that'll be on the alternative right soon that talks more about particularism and why I think it's the way forward if you're an ethnonationalist, you know, in the modern age. But, and that's just simply that the state should represent the individual better. That right now, states aren't set up that way because, you know, you just have, states are just holdovers from, you know, hundreds of years ago or, or longer and and so I think it'd be better going forward if you had a system set up where, uh, you know, people that basically I'm kind of using it as, an, you know, as a justification for ethno nationalism that this individual wants to perpetuate himself. The state is a means to that end. And therefore, 
there should be a greater multiplicity of states representing as many different human spirits as possible. Most yeah. you're talking about not like libertarian individualism, but having as many states as possible so each each person can live in their own country that reflects their values. Exactly. That's uh, interesting compared to um, what we have today of the Multicultural and Diversity Project where we're forced together with people and like ourselves and uh, everything – uh, you know, that Jared Taylor says that multicultural and diversity is a, a source of tension and conflict. However, this whole ideal of uh, ethno-nationalism or ethno-states is a very popular ideal, especially, you know, from Richard Spencer saying that. And then if you assume that, then there must be ethno-states for whites, blacks, Asians, and uh, Israel for Jews. However, what do you think there could be multicultural ethno states, or at least some? Oh, of course, I know where you're. I know where you're getting at. <laughs> you know. <laughs> oh, of course. Yeah. I mean, I, I think there definitely will. I think if there are no, if without particularism, I I don't think the you know I don't see a, a, a future where the Western world just goes back to the way it was demographically and ideologically, where like kind of white white nationalism. They wouldn't have used this term, you know, in the 1800s. But is the default, and that's just how it is. I don't think that's coming back. I think that was just a result of living in a time before, you know, communication and travel was so easy, you know, stuff like that. And just before it happened, once multiculturalism becomes a, uh, established on the ground, it's a fact, and it's there. It's not just an ideological. It's not just an ideology, you know what I mean? It's not just someone saying, oh, this would be nice, or we should do this. It's already there. And just by the fact of already being there, it's, you know, possession is nine-tenths of the law, as they say. And so it's hard to overturn it once it's in place. And so I think the way to overturn it is to accept it in some areas. You know, some states are going to be multicultural. Some states are going to be not, hopefully. And I think that's what it's Do you think hypothetically, like, there could be, like, a HAPA uh, ethnostate? A what ethno state? Like, like a Eurasian, a Eurasian uh, ethno state in North America. Oh, um, a Eurasian ethno state. <laughs> I don't know if it would be an ethno state, but I could see a future where there's a state that those that is the a majority of people are, you know, white or Asian or a mixture. I guess, like if say like the Pacific Northwest were like its own state or something, you know, <laughs> California or uh, maybe yeah, everyone. Cali well, California would be everything, you know, but uh, it's like the Bay Area or something. I guess I always hear about, you know, Silicon Valley people wanting to create their own society. If that were the case, yeah, that would be very much like that. Have you met guys in the alt-right that have Asian girlfriends or is this just something that happens in urban city areas? Well, I haven't really met many guys in the alt-right. Uh, I've been, I was at a V-Dare event once, you know, when my book was just being launched, and that's as far as I've met people, and uh, there were no Asian girlfriends there. <laughs> um, from what I've this seen, is, uh, uh, John, but I hear of John Derbyshire. John Derbyshire, of course, yeah. And I think Robert that's Weisberg right. as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. But from what I've seen, um, there's, uh, I can name Apparently, like, well, one of our upcoming uh, guests, but may, I don't know if I should say his name on the year, I don't know if. We can ask him. I... Okay, but um, I, don't I, don't know know if, I don't know who that guest is, but... I don't know if that's if he wants me revealing that or not, so I don't know. No, don't. I don't okay. know either. I don't know either, so... I'll, me I'll message you his name, and then, but I won't, I won't say it on the air. All right, don't. I'll just edit this out, but... Yeah, um... Are young people today being red-pilled or going towards national politics than, like, multiculturalism? It seems to be happening with the advent of Trump being elected as president. I think going forward, the right wing, if you're a young person, a young white person in the United States and probably the Western world in general, I think going forward, that's going to be the, maybe not the default, but I think it'll be a greater share of people who are right wing, you know, have a right-wing mindset, I think that's going to be much more dominant going forward. I think, you know, this Christian conservatism and libertarianism and, you know, constitutionalism is going to lose ground going forward, definitely, to ethno-nationalism, identitarianism.
are the people in the novel um real i mean you said this before that the novel does not reflect you or your own experiences but it seems to me that it's a very real college life going on especially in the novel as if these sound like or studied real people in the college campus life i mean i went to college um so, well, how do you mean? Could you be a little bit more specific about that? Um, it reminds me that um, there's something very uh, coming to age about the novel where sure. there's a, uh, a, a, a dorm life or a life where you go out to the city and see things and you're with, uh, you know, you're young, you could be in your uh, late teens or early 20s, and you um, are, are there and you never leave campus. It's not like you can take a car and drive places. It's also at an age where most of these kids don't have a, a driver's license. And so um, I feel as though that this novel is really targeted to someone in their early 20s. Well, it, it certainly is, yeah. I mean, I think anyone could read it at any age, you know. Everyone, at least anyone that age or older could enjoy it. Because presumably if you're older, you've had that experience, so. I think but, it's, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I don't mention cars, I suppose, in it, but they do leave. I mean, the main, the one of the main characters, Mark, he's not in college anymore. He's just that age still. <laughs> and they meet at, you know, different places outside of campus, he and Prudence. But, yeah, the other two characters, uh, yeah, they, I might not ever, ever have them leave their room, actually, Ethan and Logan. It's that, that feeling, I think, of Mark on the subway train as uh, Prudence is hugging. I, I think that's very nostalgic of taking uh, Philadelphia subway train stations with a couple of girlfriends of mine, but it, it warms heart to that. Um, we call it the L in Chicago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um... There's, I don't exactly know the Philadelphia, I just, it's, it's a subway. <laughs> um, sure. It's interesting, um, no, hold on. What, the first page of the book is the week one paper by Ethan, and it takes place actually in 97, which I mm -hmm. think is compared to today's 2017. Um, is this, did you deliberately choose the late 90s, or is it... Um, yeah. Uh, kind of a uh, is it something symbolic with that yeah definitely um the late 90s is symbolic well not just symbolic the whole book functions i always say as it is symbolic in many ways including the relationship the time uh but also and, and the fact that she's into the west you know but it's also it doesn't depend on symbolism at all for its mean for the meaning in the story so, for, example, for instance, the late 90s. Why in the late 90s? Because that's just after the Cold War ended, and it's sort of a, a time when the West reached the pinnacle, its pinnacle, you know, I think. I think it's the, very, the, you know, I think that's when the West, the Cold War ended, and, you're, you know, you the end of history, you know, had recently come out, and people were really thinking this way back then. This is before 9-11 and everything. I yeah. wanted it to take place before 9-11. Before, like that illusion's kind of shattered of you know how we're just going to go forward and liberal democracy from here on out is you know has that, won the day that's interesting and yeah so that's why it takes place in the late 90s i think the same way too that two uh the september 11th attacks was pretty much a wake-up call some have said that it's our interest with israel and that we're actually guilty for um covering up things about how the world is uh, egalitarian and basically people are different. And there's that, um, you know, it seems to be that there was certainly a bubble growing up in the, the 90s. Uh, I can fully mm -hmm. understand that, especially the, the talk about these fad, academic fads like deconstruction and post-colonialism and Edward Said. Um, there is reference of that in there. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's when, yeah, there's a great paradox in the 90s, and it's, yeah, the West has won, completely vanquished everyone else, but also it doesn't believe in itself anymore at the same time, in, in a sense, you know what I mean? It doesn't believe in itself beyond an economic system, a uh, political system. As a people, it no longer thinks of itself that way. And there's a lot about that. Mark thinks about that a lot in the course of, over the course of the book. You know, before he is introduced to Prudence when he heard the term the West, all he ever thought of was, you know, capitalism, not communism. Because he's, 
he's 21 in 1998. So, you know, he would have been, he would have been raised during, you know, the Reagan years and Cold War. They actually, I think I remember they met in a bar. Um, and I think Mark just sloppily goes ahead and says, uh, Prudence looks cute. Let me ask you out on a date. Um, do you know of the whole Manosphere gaming thing? Sure, I've heard of it. Yeah, I mean, not to say that he's playing game or something, but I think, like, I'm the type of, I'm a prudish person that wouldn't, like, specifically meet someone at a bar. It's just, I don't know yeah. if that's, a, <laughs> personally. Rather at a bookstore or something like that, I guess, right? Oh, yeah, or, like, I'm, yeah, or... I one time I met my one girlfriend at the board game club or sometimes there mm. are the places like you could meet her in class or you could meet her at work yeah. or some kind of, but it's interesting that there's that bar decision as if you can choose anyone from a bar. Like there's this, uh, you know, the decadent Tinder thing, you find your girl on Tinder and then just have fun, mm-hmm. but there's longevity between, uh, uh, Mark and Prudence. Yeah. The bar decision is, yeah, again, it's supposed to be kind of a dichotomy, you know, he's, in this sort of sleazy environment. It's St. Patrick's Day, too, when they meet. Oh. So you can picture there's a lot of people being sloppy drunk and stuff. And and he just approaches a, a Korean-American girl. Yeah. <laughs> he wouldn't have thought of it that way, I guess, because he's, he's not really thinking racially. You know, he just sees a girl that he thinks is pretty, and he goes up to her. There's also, in the early chapter, um, Mark is looking at things um, that are you know, bigger than him, this whole interest in Western civilization and, um, Mm -hmm. his love for, um, you know, he plays on Mozart. I mean, um, and then there's this uh, appreciation for that. And as the book gets further, he'll start to realize that he has this big interest in Western Civ stuff, which I think is interesting, kind of characteristically to his, um, is there any earlier indications or is it just Mark realizes he likes these things because he he likes history or that he finds a connection to himself to these things i suppose the only earlier indication would be that he enjoys reading you know reading novels but before that he's not really into history he's just he was just reading you know 19th century novels stuff like that Hmm. enjoyed the experience of you know reading you know other people's lives stuff like that getting into the fiction, fictional characters, that sort of thing. Because there's the opposite character, I think, is uh, Ethan, which is completely the, would be um, the, uh, I think it's the very, uh, you call it universalism, where it, you want to not, I'm going to say, like, tear down Western civilization, or at least dislike Logan, these. That's Logan. Logan, got- Logan, got, okay, mixing up the, <laughs> Ethan would be on the opposite side, the uh, nationalism, right? Yes. All right. And so this is interesting because um, if I can recall, I think don't both Ethan and Logan have an interest for Prudence as well? If I can... Um... Uh, Logan does, not Ethan. Logan does. Okay, I'm mixing the characters up. Logan <laughs> does, I think, which is interesting because he, he might have an interest in Prudence because she's the new American or the new race of people that's not, you know, cisgendered white or something. Maybe if I'm... Yeah, I suppose. I suppose yeah, I, I that's... Never, again, spoiler, I don't really ever go into that much. It just sort of hinted at, you know, and then at the very end, you see that he likes he, he, he likes Prudence, but the it's, reasons aren't really spelled out. It's like a love triangle going on between... Uh, Mar- to, basically, the reason is simply that she's supposed to be really beautiful, so you'd expect that lots of people would find her attractive. Okay. I think, I'm thinking she would just be a normal... Asian American character, and it could be anyone. I mean, the, I can understand a very pretty Asian American woman, but compared to um, average looking, um, that that's interesting. Though you said that, that, that she's more beautiful than, because then that means that people tend to look beyond the Asian aspect and realize that she's a beautiful character. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, like even like uh, because Ethan has this you know, sort of bias that I think a lot of nationalist types might have, you know, where he thinks of like guy going out the Asian as like a dork or something. Yes. You know, someone who's too scared to approach a white woman, something like that. And then, uh, you know, Logan's like saying something about that. Like when he sees Mark, he's, he mentions to Ethan that he doesn't look like a dork. He just looks like a normal guy. 
And then Ethan's like, well, I, you know, admit that prudence is a little different, you know, i.e. that she's hot, not just like some, you know, cute little girly looking person. They're also, Again, this is all pretty stereotypical of Asians, but you, you get the point. Yeah. There is this American postmodern culture where they're young people. And they'll be like, I'll play the frickin' piano, or that Wolfgang has a, has a badass name, or that yeah. um, Bach's pretty cool once you start and appreciate it, or that um, they have this, uh, like, like, they're, they, like, like, they have the, a, a, an interest into these Western Civ things, but they come it from, like, a, a youth culture thing, and that they also, uh, the party scene where they're drinking, too. And I, I find that kind of interesting as, like, uh, one becomes weak and then one becomes strong or you have to start somewhere to understand these bigger things. And yet they do have this weird flirtation of, um, of, you know, Bach or Wolfgang as in, um, something bigger than them or that they like these things, but they still want their decadent lifestyle. Uh, I suppose. I mean, in your t- these would be, uh, these references are to, uh, Mark and Prudence, you know, that you're making here. And they're different characters. So in Prudence's case, I don't think there's a whole lot of decadence, really. Or actually, I don't know. I don't think Mark is all that decadent either. Uh, he's just kind of lazy, I would say. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, but Prudence is just a normal, you know, a normal person. I mean, she has fun, but she's not really... You know, it's she's like, a- yeah, yeah, she's like a norm, a, what we call the normie, and the normie's interested in normie things. Um, and then, you know, some that people would say that. I just mean, I mean, yeah, she's interested in normal things and high things, you know, but, you know, psychologically. She's yeah, some, some, some people will call it decadent if they think the normal thing is decadent, but some people are yeah. okay with that. Yeah, it's overused. Like, um, Mark seems to me just an average... Um, I don't want to say alpha, but it's this this guy who's just does his guy things and he attracts someone who's bigger than him. And, you know, you would say, oh, Mark's lazy. He's not even going to school. He's not. A, but he, he's able to land uh, prudence as something. He shows masculine things like um, taking her out to places and having devotion and showing that he's a possible candidate of being a father. And, and it's funny that there's that dichotomy between those two. Yeah, I mean. He's. Could you say that question again? So, what was the like, dichotomy? Like the dichotomy is that Mark is like he looks he's like an, an average alpha. guy, right? He he mm-hmm. works at the a construction company. I I can't recall. It's what? a a marble grant. And marble, grant. marble. That's right. And um, he looks like any guy from the street that can just you know do things, right? And it seems to Prudence is this like college educated upper class thing right but she's mm-hmm. being wooed over marks i guess we would call them the manosphere calls it game where um he's uh being his uh masculine self by showing manly things and showing he's a candidate to be a, 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 a husband and then she's falling for it even though you would think that relationship would not work well because one being a beautiful korean uh american woman and him being just any other working class guy in america you know yeah um i don't know if he really has a whole lot of game actually he's he's sort of a bumbling he's sort of bumbling when he approaches her oh yeah Uh, that's what i'm saying too yeah yeah he doesn't even he doesn't even have game what he has is, I mean, first of all, he's just a normal, nice guy. He's got that, you know. But what he has, again, this is kind of key to the novel that attracts Prudence to him, is that, like, she can tell in his bumbling that part of it is because he's feeling things deeply. And she really, that's the one of the most important things to her, actually. And again, she gets this from her readings of tragedies. And, and Western art in general, you know, extolling the passionate soul, you know, the pale genius and all that. At work, when um, Mark is at work, I think he comes so, across... Sorry, sorry to interrupt, uh, but so her attraction to Mark is, in a sense, ideological. You, you know what I mean? Because she has decided that the passionate soul is the most important thing, and she thinks Mark is a passionate soul. So her attraction to Mark is 
ideological in a sense. Hmm. When Mark is at work, I do believe he finds attraction to a uh, European woman or another white mm -hmm. woman, and that's kind of the first area where he's not cheating on Prudence, but he finds his own type of appreciation for another kind of uh, white woman uh, attractive. Um, I think it's like the boss's daughter yeah. or something, and he finds a, a, an attractive to that Eastern European look compared to what he already has as Prudence, and there's some kind of uh, sinful wishing going on there. Certainly, and the fact that she's they're from Lithuania, his boss is an immigrant from Lithuania, and Mark is a quarter Lithuanian, so that, you know, there's certain <laughs> symbolism there. And Lithuanian is obviously not a common ancestry. It's a little more common. No. I mean, the whole thing where it's Irish, right? St. Patrick's Day, and anybody who's Irish with last names will go with Irish, you know. And then it's, you find relations to that. Or some there's some weird J. Philippe rushed in. You come with people that are similar to yourself, so you, you find attraction to that. Yeah, I suppose. Ethan is certainly like that. He Remember, there's a scene where uh, he's thinking about, like, who he finds attractive, and they're, like, beautiful feminine versions of himself. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think... Yeah, that's where I was getting confused. The Logan, I feel like that's a universal thing. But when you put it that way, that was Ethan, not Logan. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I was saying. Like it sounds to me like Logan because it seems like Logan would want universal people or some kind of uh, the, the. Yeah, no, that's what I'm getting confused on. But I know they're the two. Logan different is attracted to Prudence, so she yeah. obviously does like him. Yeah, but yeah. Ethan, the, the ethno nationalist, is uh, attracted to people that look like himself. That's sort of. It sounds a little cartoony, but, you know, you get the idea. I think everyone's had that sort of experience. The big criticism that sounds like a form of narcissism. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it seems, too, that um, you might hear this in the alt-right. I think Andy Nowicki wrote this on the Alternative Right blog spot. There was this meme that he liked, and it was called the... Uh, Aryan woman in the field and supposedly yeah. there's this fetish thing right where th there's this thing among the alt-right where what's their ideal woman the blonde haired uh, white Valkyrie that's going to save the day or the, the Russian woman or you know the Eastern European thing that's to trumps every single other woman and anyone in the alt-right or white nationalist circles should achieve such a woman but yet it's a fantasy at the same time well he's I think criticizing like fetishizing them, putting them up on a pedestal sort of thing, and like almost, uh, you know, worshipping their beauty. And, you know, it's, I guess that's a fair criticism. But I think a lot of people in the art have gone too far in the opposite direction, you know, just like, oh, fuck women, you know, they're all stupid. Yeah, men going their own way, I, I can totally understand. I know a lot of guys like that. Um, yeah. Now it's interesting too that prudence on her side when she went to france she got kissed by a, a french boy or a french mm -hmm. guy and that's the opposite compared to mark's own but yet prudence is is liking that maybe because she loves uh western civ or she finds the white figure but she's not like you said she's not racially on these things but certainly there's that um that, that contrast between that she likes uh the the french culture or something yeah, I think so. And also that's like, you know, her first love is in France and it's a Frenchman, you know, it's all supposed to be very romantic, yeah. obviously. And that's very formative for her. You know, she's already, you know, thinking, she's already very Western uh, oriented, very Eurocentric before that. And that's why she wants to go on the trip so bad, the school trip to Europe. Um, but, you know, that just cements it, I think. There was a lot of uh, Chinese in America that pretty much use America because that these are elitist Chinese families and they're here in America just to enjoy the American space as kind of, you're not in mainland China, but your other vacation house is in America. And it feels to me that mostly the, the Chinese go to these different uh, countries to really experience the world, but they're still close at home to the Chinese self. Now, for Prudence, she would be Korean-American, and I'm not generalizing saying that she would follow that Chinese uh, mold, but it seems that Asians definitely have a, a different outlook when considering 
um, the world, but it seems Prudence is definitely a uh, Eurocentric or like maybe she's a white person inside a Korean body. Yeah, you're talking about like birth tourists, people yes. who like want to have American citizenship so it's cheaper to go to college and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And you hear about this, yeah, a lot with Chinese people and yeah, and with Koreans sometimes. Uh, just, yeah, she does not fit that mold. She's born here, raised here, uh, so it's different. But yeah, I've certainly, I'm certainly aware of that phenomenon. Now the book really that's changed. Why we shouldn't have, you know, there shouldn't be no dual citizenship. I think that's one of the most crazy concepts of the modern world. But mm. oh I yeah, it's know. cheating, and basically all the Chinese that come in are actually spies and are benefiting the other side. The same. I do feel sympathy, however, with the, some of the Chinese who will come in the country and then actually fall in love with the white men. But however, there's still an alliance to the Chinese side. I think most men, I think the word is cuck. They use it on the alt-right. But at the same time, it's like these men really, white men on those sides who are considered cucks, really do believe in love on the, the Chinese side of things. But um, there needs to be that balance. And it seems to be their kids, let's just say hypothetically, they're going to be more like prudence. The kids of mixed race yeah couple. that's what i'm saying it's like when generation wise when but it seems in a multicultural society they demand that they're like this postmodern individual immediately but it doesn't happen and people have loyalties to bigger things like race yeah certainly the book the the book divides really quickly when you get to the chapter on universalism versus nationalism and that's when uh, ethan and logan or having just a, this, uh, what I have in a picture in my head, just actually two kids just talking about things. I don't know if they're high or drinking, but just, uh, I don't know if they're like Victorian men talking like these things, or but they're just young kids uh, talking about the world through their own philosophical things. I mean, this sounds like something you had a discussion with or you've talked to, but it, once again, I don't know if you've, actually press the record button and transcribe two people actually talking in a room. But when I'm reading it, it feels and sounds like it. No, if I had done that, it would not have been as eloquent, I don't think. There's a English writer uh, or orator, Jonathan Bowden, and uh, he did the same thing with Apocalypse TV, him and Bill Hopkins, and it was just literally a transcript of them talking in the same room. But there's, they're more on the English avant-garde. But the thing is with this, it seems very of, um, you can understand what they're talking about, but at the same time, I really feel like I'm reading a, a, a discuss form or actually comments on the internet. Hmm. Uh, I suppose. I mean, it, yeah, it's just supposed to be the setting. It's just they're having a late night dorm room argument. You know, I think everyone's had that. Mm-hmm. Um, and... You know, one guy's a universalist, one guy's a nationalist, and eventually it comes out that the nationalist is, you know, is a racial nationalist. Like, at first, he doesn't want to admit that, but, you know, eventually he just says, you know, to hell with it. Because when when you're taking a sort of civic nationalist, you know, half-measure uh, approach, you can't, you're fighting with one hand tied behind your back. You know, all your arguments don't make as much sense. And the, and they can and the left wing, you know, the egalitarian universalist person is always going to be able to catch you. You know what I mean? He's always going to be able to trump you logically if you're arguing that way because you're you're admitting that he, you know, that his starting point is valid. And when once you do it, is and it is superior to nationalism. And you're kind of just saying, well, it's it doesn't work. You know, it's you know we need to have rules. Blah blah blah. And you know, once, but once you get down to race, then you can really start to have a legitimate argument and make your case, I think. It seems that, um, especially on the universal side, there, this was pretending that it was in 97. The, certainly the universal side sounds so big, especially if this whole racial egalitarianism. Now, if you fast forward uh, 20 years from then, today, the left is social justice, you know, social justice warrior culture. And that wasn't really known back in the mid nineties. It wasn't really a, they didn't have a name for it, but if this was today, you would call on, um, 
Logan side, the, the classical social justice warrior that doesn't want to care. It's about my feelings. It's not really about any logic or anything. If you sit down with someone, it's just um, you use a lot of rhetoric and you say these words, but these really words are like a self-confirming bias where you, you get these things out and you just want to hear what what's good to them and i feel like this this discourse they're having is just really they they were in two semesters of college and they were given really hard critical theory and now they have the like the world on their shoulders and they're like uh there's still the language like like fucking and shit like like young people would say like i was mentioning with like wolfgang is a uh, badass and this and that but they're still young kids fighting over these hard concepts and so if you back out from the whole rhetoric, it really seems that if you go above it, it's really just two kids being experienced in a huge world they can't comprehend. Or, um, I suppose I don't know. I'm just I was actually just trying to create the best argument I could for each side. You know, I did, didn't want to straw man the universalist argument at all. I was trying to come up with the best arguments I could, arguments I'd never even heard them make uh, for Logan because I don't see the point in. Like, you know, picking out the stupidest argument that some SJW has, you know, comes up with and then arguing against that, knocking down that straw man. I don't see the purpose in that. Because I, I, I think a lot of times uh, people on our side do, you know, sort of take the low-hanging fruit when they're arguing against the other side. And then when a, a smart – and so I'm, I'm looking at it like how does this normal smart person, you know, who's not committed to either side look at this? And a lot of times if you read an argument – from people on our side, uh, it's the sort of thing that if you're not already, if you don't already agree with us, it's not going to convince you. If you st stop, if you stop and think about it for a second, you might say, "Oh, well, yeah." In a specific instance, that's a good point. You know, if you argue against, say, affirmative action or something, or the most outrageous, you know, whiteness class, you know, denigrating whites or some shit like that, mm -hmm. uh, someone might say, "Oh, yeah, well, we shouldn't do that." But you know, so you have a point there, but you're missing the larger point. The larger point of you know that we should all get along and, you know, that people have equal rights, blah, blah, blah. And so I don't think you convert people by not, by creating these straw men. So I try to create the best argument I possibly can for the universalist side. There's this thing called the alt-left at the moment, and um, it's there's a website called www.altleft.com. It's by Rabbit. And basically what he's saying is he's not for egalitarianism, but he feels that there's a need to reform the left-wing movement and take in some of the ideals of the alt-right, being the left-wing faction of the alt-right. And it's it's been getting good, and some bloggers like Prince of Queens have been using the term alt-left to be anti-social justice warrior culture. However, at this time, it really shows you that the left is this really established party, and the only things they have left is uh, Jacobin Mag and Verso Books and uh, maybe Noam Chomsky and Slavjob Zizek, but it still doesn't tick up, and it's you have to question whether egalitarianism is really a left-wing value, right? It seems like you can have egalitarianism in the right wing, and you have egalitarianism in the left wing. Uh, I don't know if I would agree with that. I think egalitarian definitely is uh, a left-wing hmm. value. You don't have to be inegalitarian in some cruel, uh, you know, hierarchical sense to be right-wing, I guess. Like, particularism is not necessarily uh, inegalitarian unless you're looking at it in the sense that this particular country that's, say, an ethnostate, it's only inegalitarian, you know, in the sense... I mean, it could be an egalitarian in any number of ways. It could be an aristocracy or some sort of oligarchy or whatever. But, the, you know, it could, in theory, just be a democracy, blah, 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 that doesn't. But it's still going to be an egalitarian in the sense that it doesn't accept people based on race into its country. So it's always going to have that. But I think there is a point where uh, the left, you could, the particularism could, in theory, I don't really see this uh, on the horizon, but in theory, it could lead to a sort of merger of left and right because it's, like I say, it's an egalitarian in the sense that it, it, the states would exclude people. All kinds of states would be excluding people for all kinds of reasons, for religious reasons or ethnic reasons or whatever they feel like. But also just the sense, but in the sense that everyone has 
that there are more states and more people are represented, more people have more choices. Uh, that, in that sense, I guess it's sort of egalitarian. Um, in the second part, or the birth of prudence part two, it begins in the winter time, and um, this sounds like a, a cliche, but in college life, the first semester is fall, and then in the second semester is winter, and then spring. Did you plan out the novel being like a, a single year through college, or that it goes spring, summer, fall, winter? Uh, no, it was not inspired by uh, okay. the Gilmore Girls reboot. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. But in the second part, it becomes quite aware that um, I think uh, Marco is more aware of things and is more mm -hmm. on the, uh, you know, having doubts or at least that the tragedy starts to begin. And um, Yeah, the book's uh, more or less divided. The first, it's, there's part one, there's the argument in between, and then there's part two. And but yeah, basically part one is background. And, you know, the, sec the middle part is the argument between Ethan and Logan, universalism versus nationalism. And part two is, I guess you could say, the plot unfolding. There's uh, one line, or I think it's the June 6, 1998, where it's uh, Prudence and Mark read the lines to each other with fury and passion. And uh, I think it looks like some kind of um, the play that they have. And it's... The Bacchae. What's that? The Bacchae, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it, it's a Euripides play, and yeah, that's what I think is interesting is that once again they're um, you'll hear this turn live action role playing or uh, LARPing mm -hmm. into this mode, and I just sometimes think it's funny because um they're really passionate about this whole uh, Western background, especially with this one because the I'm going to be honest this 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 um European history was never my thing. I actually went to school for Asian studies. But um, I actually graduated out with um, a degree in both English and communications as a double major. But um, it's it's like you have to have really passionate to know this, like like Argamemnon or um, you know or uh, Gilgamesh. It reminds me of something like this. It's almost like not autistic, but it's certainly like they take it to the passionate gear that it means something. Yeah, I suppose. They're, you know, they're just having fun. This is what they're into. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's an interesting sense of fun. I I I'm I, I don't know. It's um But w are you willing to say or not to give spoilers out for the listeners, but are you willing to talk about how the tragedy happens and um where how exactly <laughs> what made that happen or elaborate of why you wrote those things? Uh, well, as I think I said earlier, it, it basically happens because they're of different races. You know, that's a necessity uh, to make this work. And it happens because she's attracted to a certain kind of person, you know, the quote-unquote passionate soul. And he is that passionate soul who's searching for something more. And that something more turns out to be his Western identity, which she gives to him and that breaks them up. That's interesting. I mean, that's the cliff notes version. That's the footnotes. That, that's interesting because, um, if you consider liking someone simply that the clothes you wear or what you believe in seems to be a very popular or immature thing, especially on the high school level, that if you dress all black and you look like a greaser, you know, or uh, um, a James Dean, someone wants to go out with you, but you're really shallow when it comes to personality. When people say that love is based upon both connecting spiritually to one another, but at the same time, if it really does work out, then things, right? It's based upon uh, these emotional. So it turns out that Prudence is really, um, likes this, she's using um, Mark as this kind of uh, a sponge or, or pet, which you can, uh, she, she enjoys loving from. Like, it, it's this, it's like women choose and men display, but then sometimes women can be very abusive in their choosing relationship, and they actually have the upper hand rather than uh, men choosing and women displaying. They have the upper hand how? Well, well, um, like women, it's often said, you know, women will choose men display, 
And then it's usually the the patriarchal oracle that the men's got to look out for the women, hunter gatherer. But let's say for Prudence's case that she's using um, him, Mark, to get her desires out, right? Because Mark understands her interest for Western things, but she doesn't like him even more deeply, and it's rather just a shallow relationship based upon this uh, exploitative uh, thing. And I see this a lot with young kids. It's a personality thing. No, it's, oh, okay. she likes, it's his personality that she's fundamentally attracted to, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah, that he is passionate. It's, it's not, like a, not like he's an emo that, he, that she's attracted to. <laughs> It's that he is passionate. That's what she likes about him. Mm. And just to reframe, she breaks up because it realized they just, it doesn't, it's, they just don't work or that she realizes that, she, does she realize that she loves him for a certain value and that she's been using him or she feels bad or any guilt or is it just? Now she fundamentally thinks he's been using her oh. actually. Uh, and that he's, I mean, she just suspects correctly that he's become a racist and that's why she breaks up with him oh okay yeah um this might sound weird um i had a i have an asian girlfriend and um we uh were very close to because you're a racist no she um (laughs) well we're not we're not together right now but um i brought her to some white nationalist events i was kind of that naughty type and um no, she uh, breaked up with me because she thought I was taking it. Um, you might say that I could have been uh, racist. But you have or you had. Well, I don't want to pry. Sorry. Go on. I'm sorry, but I'm saying, yeah, she might have broke up with me because, but it was more like I was radical and there was these things, but it worked. There was this flirtation where these ideals are dangerous, right? And it becomes this thing where it's like, if you want to go on the ride, then come along it's just it's fun you have to step your your feet in the water however it's um you, you know yeah it's funny you put it that way you're a racist that, that's, that's just basically like saying you're mean right but if you you overcome that it becomes that um you realize they're just words but then it it, it shows you that when people call you a racist it's really just a, a shallow way of understanding someone it's just once again i think people get caught up in le- rhetoric and i really do believe the most like uh, like macho, like let's say skinhead white nationalist could fall for in love with a, a blue haired feminist and big, what's dividing them rhetoric. I know that sounds very Shakespearean, but, um, I feel as though maybe there could be a connection in that. Um, yeah, I don't know. Everyone, you know, everyone's different, I suppose. Whatever turns you on. I can't explain why everyone's attracted to everyone. That's for sure. Oh yeah. That's what I was saying about is that, um, yeah, exactly. Ideals are dangerous, and depending your ideals gravitate certain people in that subculture, and it's interesting. But for uh, Mark's case, it's more like <laughs> he doesn't mean to be racist, but his uh, it turns out Prudence to, to fig, you know, says, "Oh, that's 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 racist," and then you have to. It becomes a strange. Uh, it is a tragedy in that sense. Now, when I think it's funny, is that the big scarlet R is on you and it's just, uh, it's annoying. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, you could understand in her case, I mean, if he's racist and she's a different race, I could understand why she might think, well, maybe I shouldn't be dating this guy. Well, um, I'll give away the last Especially paragraph. because he's not just, you know, not just racist, but he's, he grows distant, you know, also to her. Um, call her as much. She doesn't want to be around her, that sort of thing. I'll read the last paragraph of the book, but it says, She found a modest cottage in a remote Swiss village and settled there, becoming a local tutor. There her children and her ideals might have a fresh start together, might grow together and come together, and there would be nothing else to come between them. Which I think is an interesting way to end the book. Um, yeah. That's, that's on... Um, that's like a, a, a not a cliffhanger, but what was any intention for that? Or uh, just that she hasn't changed. She's still who she is. She still wants to do this. Mm. She still wants to like. She wants to make her kids think that way. She still wants to make her kids Eurocentric. Mark hasn't, you know, made her jaded towards uh, Westerners in the West. Sounds uh, like prudence. I just think she needs to be more isolated now from other people because they might get in the way you know she's basically it's she doesn't want 
racist whites to get in the way of uh, her personal uh, love and appreciation of Western civilization and get in the way of her kids having the same thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, it's, to me, it sounds like now that if uh, she has kids, she, they're all going to be half Asian or half Korean. and that No, fully. Not fully. She has them with, uh, with another Asian guy. I believe Korean. Oh. I don't Oh, okay. Okay. So that, okay. I was just suspecting because we were just talking about earlier about the F- ethnostate's multiculturalism and we're just like, oh wait, does this sound like an Asian Aryan ethnostate? But yeah, the, now that she, now that you point that out, that she would prefer someone similar like herself in the Swiss, it turns to that whole Chinese, uh, the birth tourism thing. And, uh, we've, we've kind of, uh, yeah. talked about that before, but, um, since then, you have written articles on Alternative Right and on Radix Journal as well. Um, mm-hmm. What was it like or what was some of the reactions you've been getting from those websites and how have uh, other people have commenting on your work on those? Uh, I don't know. Mostly positive, I think. I think mostly positive. There was the James uh, O'Mara interview on Countercurrents about a uh, guy loses Asian chick, and there was some dispute on there, which I thought was funny. I remember reading the uh, our uh, comments yeah. for that. Yeah, I think because he was well, one of his he had a criticism that it's kind of convoluted a lot of what he wrote. But oh yeah, um, he one thing he criticized was well, Mark's not some leader setting an example or he's, and he's also just one person, you know, if he is to date and procreate with an Asian, it's not any harm to the white cause. So, you know, the whole issue is kind of phony Mm. in the book, but it's not, he's looking at it too, I guess, too logically. Mark's just not attracted to her anymore because of this, because of, it's not like he makes an ideological decision that I have to, uh, you know, defend the white race by not dating this Asian chick. It's that now that he is, now that he identifies as a sort of white identitarian, you know, he doesn't really have a name for it, but you know, when you're reading it, he, he, you know, he's a, he's a white nationalist or ethno nationalist or identitarian or whatever. And when you have that mindset, you're just not attracted to an Asian girl anymore. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. I mean, you know, I'm sure there are people who are, you know, but it's not like some great stretch to think, oh, once you, you know, have this new ideological viewpoint, it could change the way you see other things. And that's that's what happened with Mark. Uh, What are your plans for the future and what um, do you plan on writing? Do you plan on writing another book or do you plan on writing more releases and do you plan on going to future um, events? Um, well, if events are close enough to me, I guess I'd go close enough and cheap enough. I'd certainly consider going. Um, but yeah, other books, I, the article that I have coming out soon on alternative, right. Is sort of the, the beginning stages of another book. I would say a book about particularism and why I think it's the way forward in going for the work for ethno nationalists in the world. That's a world that's been, that's globalized and, uh, individ- and where individualism is so important. And so that's going to be my next book, I think. Do you plan on doing more of the interviews with the uh, on the Alternative Right blog spot, of getting people on the alt-right and just interviewing them on questionnaires? I know you did it with Alex Fontana and James Lawrence. Definitely, yeah. I just had one go up on Saturday or Sunday with uh, Guillaume du Rocher, if I'm pronouncing that right. I think so. It's called like Leo de Rocha, you know, but I imagine it's pronounced de Rocha. Um, so yeah, I'll have more of those also, definitely. Well, uh, Ryan Andrews, it's been an excellent show. We've covered uh, so many interesting topics. I'd like to uh, thank you for being on. Thanks for having me. And also, uh, thanks, Pilater. Nice talking to you, Ryan. I really enjoy Birth of the Prudence, and I suggest all the listeners go ahead and buy the Birth of Prudence and check out V-Dare. Dot com.